Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Most Merciful, I'd like to welcome you, dear viewers, to another in our series, Understanding the Quran, in which we are looking at the interpretation of the 67th chapter of the Quran, known as Surah Al-Mulk, or the chapter of the Dominion. And in this segment, we'll be looking at the last few verses of the chapter beginning with verse number 29 in which Allah says Say, He is the most gracious. We believe in Him and we put our trust in Him. You will soon come to know which of us is in obvious error. Allah closes off the chapter reminding the believers to put their trust in Him. The trust is not an emotional a feeling, etc., because oftentimes we may trust in things based on emotion. But Allah says that Allah is the most gracious, is the most merciful, and we believe in Him and believe in His mercy. And on the basis of that, we put our trust in Him. We find this issue of trust mentioned in many places in the Quran. It is a portion of faith. Full trust in Him. For example, in the 12th chapter, verse 67, Prophet Jacob is quoted as saying, The decision rests only with Allah. I put my trust in Him alone, and, on, and all who trust should only trust in Him. We also find in the 63rd chapter, verse 3, Allah, they're also saying, whoever trusts in Allah will find him sufficient. All of this is reminder for the believers that it is Allah alone whose trust will never be broken. We put our trust in human beings all the time and we are disappointed. They may not, as the nature of the human soul, the human mind, the hum human society, that trust is not 100%. We try to put our trust in those who seem to be most reliable, but no matter how reliable they may appear to us, there will come times when they break our trust. However, Allah is one whose promises are all true. He never breaks his trust. Therefore, if that is the case, he is the one we find Allah giving us some rationale for, for why we should put our full trust in him in the second chapter, verse 216, where he said, Asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrul lakum. Perhaps you may dislike something and it is good for you. And you may like something which is bad for you. And Allah knows and you do not. This is the reality. We know what is best for us. And as a result of that, we desire it, we seek it, we may turn to God in prayer for it, you know maybe you know very extensive prayers begging Allah for this but Allah knows ultimately whether this is good for us or not and we really don't know because we don't know the consequence of what is to happen when things come to us similarly we may love or we may dislike something which uh, you know we find it very uncomfortable etc etc but there is good in it for us. Actually, the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, 
you know, reminded us that may be good and behind pleasurable and enjoyable things may be evil. When he said, Hujibati Naru Bishahawat, that the hellfire is veiled by pleasurable things. And paradise, on the other hand, is veiled by things which we dislike. This is, this is reality. This is the ultimate reality. That the, the evil ends. For there are things which are pleasurable to us, enjoyable to us. Whereas the things which are going to take us to paradise, they are things which require us to struggle and to strive with ourselves, to overcome our desires for other, to submit ourselves, our wills to God. This is a struggle. And as such, paradise is veiled by things that we have to struggle with ourselves about. And that's why we, we feel that they're not really and enjoyable but unfortunately behind those things in most cases is hell so Allah stresses in the Quran that the believers should put their trust in Allah and by doing that whatever trials they face in life that firm trust in Allah will give them patience to deal with the trials of life this is why also we find you know, Allah warning us that we will be tried with the things that we love. This is the nature of this life. But he said, give glad tidings to those who are patient. وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتْهُمْ مُصِيبًا those who, when a calamity strikes them, what do they say? Qalu inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raj'oon. They say, we belong to Allah, and to Him is our return. This is their expression of their patience in handling the trials of this life. And also, Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, you know, had said, and this is only in the case of the believer. If good comes to him, he is thankful to Allah for the good, and he doesn't become so involved and so happy, you know, with the good that he has received that he actually forgets God and just, you know, just is lost in, in, in his happiness at having achieved this good. Instead, he remembers God and is thankful. Thankful not just in words, but in doing what is obligatory on him, and on the other hand, if a trial befalls him, he is So the whole of one's life is a source of gaining reward from God if one is patient. Now, on the other hand, impatience, where a person doesn't put their trust in Allah and, and leave their affair over to Allah after they've done, whatever they could. Because of course, the issue of trust in, in Allah from the Islamic perspective is not blind trust, meaning that one just puts trust in God and doesn't make an effort. One wants children and trust in God that God is going to give them children. But they don't go out of their homes to try to find a suitable wife to get married to. How can one then expect to have children? This is nonsense. So having made their maximum effort, then they turn their affair over to Allah. As in the example where the, an individual came into the mosque on one occasion when Prophet Muhammad, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, was sitting with his companions. And just before he reached the point to go and sit with them, he remembered he had left his camel outside and he hadn't tied it up. So he turned to the Prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, and asked him, Should I trust in Allah or should I go and tie my camel? The Prophet ﷺ said, Aqilha wa tawakkal. Tie your camel and then put your trust in Allah.
In other words, the individual has to make his personal Then he puts his trust in Allah. Similarly, we have what is known as dua al-istikhara, the prayer or supplication for seeking the good, seeking what is best. In that prayer, Prophet Muhammad had said that whenever any one of us has a decision to make, made a decision to go and do something, we should, after having made that decision, turn our affairs over to Allah by making a particular dua, known as dua al-istikhara. In this dua, we recognize Allah's, the completeness of his knowledge and his favor on us, etc. And we ask him to guide us to what is best. And if this affair that we have decided upon is in fact good for us, then make it not really good for us. Then take it away from us and remove our love from it in our hearts and replace it with something else and show us what is good wherever it may be. This is the essence of this dua. And this dua, dua al-istikhara, is an expression of putting one's trust in Allah. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, after, you know, after a person has made a decision, has set their mind on something, this is when they turn to Allah to, see, to seek His guidance and put their trust in Him. Is they're not following this. They may have two affairs before them. They don't know which one to take, which one to follow. So they make dua istikhara and are expecting Allah to tell them it's this one or that one. So what has happened is that they've even made up a series of things to expect how to know. In other words, they say you make this dua al-ishar just before you go to bed at night. And if you have a dream in which you, know, you see green, that means go ahead. If you have a green, the dream which you see red, it means don't do it. You know, they've invented a series of... of um, interpretations for dreams to in indicate for you whether you should go ahead or not. So the, the dua al-istikhara is being used, you know, as a means of making decisions for people. can about that person. After we're certain that this person is, in fact, bona fide, is good, good choice, etc., etc., and we've made a decision, yes, let's go ahead with this person. At this point, we make istikhara. And it, it's not to be done before going to bed at night. It can be done any time in the day. And the answer is not in dreams. But the answer comes in how we feel about this affair uh, later on. If we find difficulties being, you know, developing with regards to it. These are among the signs to let us know that this is not suitable. So the dua al-istikhara, as I said, is an expression of whatever one can do. And of course, dua al-istikhara cannot be done for things which are already commanded by Allah. I mean, Allah commands us to pray five times a day. We don't sit and make dua al-istikhara. Should I pray five times a day or not? No. These are things already commanded by God. Nor are, is dua al-istikhara done in things which are highly recommended. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has recommended us to do this thing. We don't do istikhara, dua al-istikhara for the thing which has already been recommended. But in the area of things which are not commanded, not specifically recommended, this is the area, the neutral area, this is where when we make our things which have been prohibited, you know, a person uh, is thinking about, well, should I buy cigarettes and start smoking, or should I not? You don't make dua al-istikhara for this. This is something forbidden in Islam. Smoking is prohibited in Islam. It is sinful. So you can't make dua al-istikhara to do something sinful. Similarly, something which is already disliked, Prophet Sallallahu has indicated, Allah has indicated, this is something despised liked, makru, such a thing we do not make dua al-istikhara about either. Dua al-istikhara is only for those areas which have not been specifically recommended, disliked, prohibited, or commanded. It has given us guidance through the Quran to put our trust in God. Knowing, as Allah said, in ma'al ursu yusra, with every difficulty comes ease. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. No soul is burdened beyond their capacity. Knowing these promises of Allah gives us uh, a sense of patience and trust to deal with our situations, and we go ahead in our lives in this way. Whenever we make a decision, we put our trust then in Allah. 
But we don't put the trust before making decision. However, amongst common Muslims, assuring one's desires will come true has developed. And this system is the amulet system, where people have developed amulets, commonly called ta'wiz in the subcontinent, hijab in, in Sudan, other names in different parts of the Muslim world, where people will make up amulets, and there are people who specialize in it. They'll make up amulets, and you need this to be done, you want that to happen, etc., etc. You wear this amulet, you use this amulet this way or that way, and whatever you need is going to be done. Unfortunate, this has become very widespread. Whoever wears a charm, they wear something, then they trust in it. Instead of trusting in Allah, they've put their trust in it. And he said that the wearing of amulets is shirk. The wearing of amulets is shirk. What we find, as I said, amongst the common Muslims, is that there is a popular desire to want to know the future, to be able to establish good for oneself in the future. And this is built around a system known as the Abjad system of numerology. Abjad, actually these are the first four letters of the ancient Arabic alphabet. It started with Alif, Ba, Jim, and Dal. And what they did was they gave Alif a value. They say it's equal to one. to four and so on and so forth. This is given all the 28 letters of the alpha alphabet numerical values. Then they will use these numerical values to transform Quranic verses into numbers and they will you know make certain practices with these numbers dividing them this way and that way and you know and out of it drawing meanings and establishing principles which are of course false principles. And the great 14th century scholar, uh, known as Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he had written in his book, Fath al-Bari, he had written about this issue of numerology using this abjad system. And he said, numerology is completely false and should not be relied upon. For it has been accurately reported that the companion of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa Ibn Abbas, used to forbid its use and consider it a form, and used to consider it a form of magic. Now, the origins of numerology we can see in the Greeks. You know, amongst the Assyrians and Babylonians, heavenly bodies were at the same time gods as well as personified numbers. For example, Ishtar. Ishtar, uh, a goddess, she was also the deified number 15. And the moon, uh, which was, we you know, the moon, Earth satellite, the moon, uh, in that system was the lunar deity seen and also the deified number 30. And so these numbers would be used in their ritual worship. In Greece, we find the idea of numerology in the idea that all things could be ultimately expressed in terms of numbers. Everything could be broken down into numbers. And what they did was they gave the Greek alphabet letters specific numerical values. The Jews followed this system and incorporated it into their system of mysticism known as the Kabbalah. And um, this system uh, predates the time of Christ. And we can find uh, from it a numerical science which came to be known as the Gematria, in which each letter of the Hebrew alphabet was in turn given a numerical value. And prescriptions were made from it, create certain atmospheres for certain things to take place. In part two, called Aina i Amaliyat, which was put together by Sufi Muhammad Azizur Rahman Sahib Panipati, 
and section 3, part 3, Naqshi Suleiman, are prepared by Khwaja Ashraf Ali Laknawi. We can find these prescriptions as to how to put it together the various amulets. For example, in part 2, put together by Sufi Muhammad, the contents promises that amulets will cause love, victory, pregnancy, increase sales in one's shop, the repayment of loans, to spoil bewitchment, to release captives, to return. Naval and to develop strong memory, you know. And uh, the, the author of this section pointed out certain rules that the people preparing these amulets should uh, keep in mind. And they said, he said there, keeping in mind the position of the stars and movements is but essential for one who practices spells or writes an amulet. That was rule number three. Rule number five, performing ablution is essential for muttering a spoon. The book page, you know, farewell. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.